Anyone has a question to begin with? Uh, is it ever too late to develop uh, good time management strategies um, in general? Because my children don't have it naturally, so is it too late in general? I think they got it from me. So, what do you have? Any advice to get them pointed in the right direction? They get everything done at the last minute. And I don't think I want them to do that anymore. Uh, do you have any advice on that? Oh my goodness. Okay, this is what I do. So, <laughs> no, is the answer. It's absolutely never, ever, ever too late. I just work with college students who will come to me and say they need to work on their time management and they've been horrible at it their whole life. They can get better at it. But I think you have to figure out, well, because you're saying you want your kids to be more organized or manage their time better. Why would they want to do that? So, what would be their motivator? Is it that they want to have more time to spend with their friends or they want to get more sleep or they want to be less stressed out? So, we can working with them to figure out what's going to motivate them to want to do that because because I say so isn't going to be enough of a reason for them to change the way they manage their time. But if you can figure out what's motivating them and why they might want to do that, and then you have a doorway open to come in and maybe work with them on some skills that might help them do that more effectively, but they will need to build the skills as well. The motivation alone is not enough, but the skills without the motivation also aren't going to work. So if you get those two together, you, it's never too late to change. Hi. Um, this may not be more related to the college preparation, but uh, I'm, I, I'm more interested in the learning process itself. I see Ms. Scarlett, the XQ, are very hard work and all the new scientists <laughs> going on. So I just wanted to uh, understand the process of uh, visual learning for kids uh, because the way the education is doing it is mostly to the electronic media. And there is, there is a there's a concern about how that's distracting the, the brain processing, right? So it's it's all this instant gratification process, which is uh, kind of the reducing the patience of the kids and all the stuff. And how how do you, do you, what do you suggest that like deal with the um, they try to teach kids who are more visually uh, visual learners, as I say. Uh, rather than uh, for us, we came from a very traditional book and then we get to the norms. So, how do, we, how do you balance the technology versus the, uh, the, the distractions? I think uh, um, that's a very good, very good question. And uh, so, my area of uh, uh, interest as well as expertise, you can say, is in uh, call. Sorry. There are many mics <laughs> that may be on. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the skill is called executive function, and it's a very misleading term because it may make you believe executive means something to do with running a company, but it's uh, mainly to do with your self-management. And so the way I will simply put in the context of learning and education, it's learning to learn and learning to think about your learning. Uh, so those skills are not formally taught in school. They develop, uh, they're developmentally late to emerge. So a 17-year-old is more proficient than a 10-year-old, and a 21-year-old is more proficient than a 17-year-old. However, uh, the time management question or self-regulation question or how do I make a plan, uh, one of the things that I would, uh, a cautionary tale uh, from a parent perspective as well as uh, uh, one who has done this for 20 years is I think we are managing our children without giving them an opportunity to manage themselves. And, and it's a, a very important and, and delicate balance for us to know uh, when my goals uh, for you stop and when you begin to have goals for yourself. And so I hope the parents can guide in that process, but somehow that line is very blurry, so we impose our goals on our children, and if they don't cooperate, then we have two options, strong arm them. Uh, and generally works if you have good, compliant, cooperative kid. It doesn't work if you have a rebel. A rebel. Uh, but secondarily, uh, as Maggie was saying, these are skills that need to be uh, uh, definitely taught with great intention. Uh, and the intention, so exposure to that skill will not develop it. 
Just talking about the skill will not develop it. Experiencing and practicing that skill will develop it. So one of the temptations I will warn you to not do is to lecture your kid about the skill you want them to have. What they need really is the experience of having to develop and implement that skill. So quickly, if you want your time, a child to develop time management, you want the child to experience what it means to manage the t uh, time. And it's a complicated matter. I will not take more time, but we have some other expert views. So I would love everybody to contribute because it's such an important skill. So uh, one more comment about the visual learning. I think I wouldn't really dissect learning from a visual learner and auditory learner. Um, uh, even though we evaluate uh, learning styles and learning preferences, I really think learning is a m complex, multifaceted experience. And we have certain preferences, and we tend to learn best in the zone where we have our tendencies more crafted or more uh, we lean into. But my uh, urge always to students is, are you developing your weaknesses as well as your strengths? Because if you really feed and nurture your strengths and you never cater to your weaknesses, then there is a skill gap. And that's where I feel that doesn't allow you to succeed in college. So with that, I will let other experts speak. I think I would just like to add a little bit to that. Um, when when all of our children right now are exposed to technology all the time. I mean, most school students are using computers all the time. You know, they just have to open up another tab and there's Facebook, there's all these things, you know, on their phone, they're getting text messages, there's Twitter. And and I think part of it is is looking at them and seeing how much time are they spending doing these different types of things and is it impacting their academics and what their goals are. So are they intrinsically motivated to 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 get to Duke or to get to Harvard or to get to Yale? And if they are not utilizing their time appropriately, then how do we teach them those skills? So so there are things out there. I mean there are on your iPhone, there are ways that you can see how much time you're spending on particular apps or particular programs. Um, there's there's ways on your computer that you can track, and that is helpful to, to show them what what how much time that they're spending in these different areas, and, and is that keeping them from achieving the goals that they want? I'd also mention that uh, it's not something that comes natural to everyone, so you have to identify and understand your child. So if they are falling short in their executive function, that is probably one of the most important things they could take with them into college. And colleges have a lot of support systems, but that is not one thing that they really are good at. And if you go to some of the colleges that you saw the panelists on earlier today, part of the school's strategy is to overwhelm them with, with and force them to test themselves. As a friend of mine right here would say at MIT, they tell you, if your child is not stressed, we're not doing our job. Because <laughs> they need you to be pushed. Because you've been excellent in other areas, you need to be pushed. So I would highly recommend, if you see your child is a little behind in their executive function, to seek professional help from someone here. Because it's not something that's going to just all of a sudden get better. And no matter how bright they are, with the workload that they're going to have at a top institution, they are not going to be able to organize the things on their own. And they might be successful now because some of you might be helicopter parents. I'm not sure you are or you aren't. But you might be pushing them. On their own, they're going to have to manage their schedule. They're going to have to be adults. And that's very important. So proactively seek out uh, assistance in helping them with, them with their executive function. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, uh, specifically as a parent, you know, as we're getting ready for high school or some rising ninth grader, the, the anxiety we have is really uh, what techniques we can learn from from your experience, as well as any resources that you recommend that we as parents of high schoolers, uh, you know, preparing our kids for their journey in college, uh, can, can, you know, that you would like to recommend to us, you know, techniques and resources. I can take that. Uh, so as a rising ninth grader, one of the things that we did in our school was uh, kind of plan out the four, next four years, right? Uh, what you are going to do at the end of every year. And uh, the way that my son was successful was setting milestone for every year and trying to see whether you are achieving that end result and kind of measuring it against it and tweak the plan a little bit to make sure that you are 
going to achieve what you decided for. So that really helped him because at the end of the year, you are doing your own self-assessment. Uh, you set a goal for academic uh, achievement. You set a goal, goal for uh, extracurricular activity, right? And then you try to see whether you are reaching there or not, right? Because if you start late, you are not going to achieve it. And if you don't put your effort and if you don't assess yourself, then also you are not going to achieve it, right? So. Uh, having a positive kind of thinking process and tweaking and putting the effort where it is actually required uh, for the next kind of uh, milestone is what really helped him. I would second that we weren't quite as forward uh, thinking with yearly milestones, but in the seventh grade, we sat down and talked to him about colleges he might be considering. How many seventh graders really know where they want to go? So that's not fair, but we told him that we wanted him to do well enough where he could make the choice on what school he wants to go to as opposed to the schools selecting him based on how he's performed. So we went online and picked, and they have basically the standards for each of the schools that he was interested in. We put them right above his desk where he studied every day. So his motivation every day was, I can't be just good. I can't just get an A because looking at where I want to go, and it's got to be him motivating himself. I'm going to need to perform at this level. And that gave him a benchmark because if you don't have a destination, you're never going to get there. You can weave your path, but he very clearly saw what he needed to do at a very early age. Because I hate to say it, if you're a junior or you finish your sophomore year, it's probably too late to make a, uh, a course correction that's going to get you to where you want to be. If I can add to that, yes. Um. <laughs> Um, a little bit at a uh, home front, uh, not so academic and not so intellectual. Uh, one thing that when my freshman came home, he said uh, he missed the most uh, was our three times a week meals that we had together every night. Uh, so even thick and thin of college, I mean high school, all four years, uh, this was something we used to have dinners five nights during the week that went down uh, because of the, all the extracurricular activities uh, went down to three nights. Um, and we made a point, we as a family adjusted, we are Indians so we can afford to eat late. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of, that's not something very common uh, uh, other places. But uh, that was one thing that I would suggest that as much as you're focused on the future, make sure you nurture their soul. And the nurturing comes from two sources. One is to have some conversations about how they feel, about what they're doing. And, and I think that stress and anxiety, um, channeling that, giving them an opportunity to talk about it with you, uh, whether they respond or not. They are teenagers. They may not even care to talk to you about it. But you do your job. I mean, sometimes it may take you three weeks before they open up, but do that. And secondly, I think kind of uh, nutrition. I found that sleep and nutrition were two big things that were getting compromised heavily, which was uh, uh, when they moved from middle school, which was very regimented and, and very well supervised, we suddenly felt that they were grown up six feet tall and they should be, uh, you know, feeding themselves breakfast. And so um, I, I kind of just would remind you to not let them do that. Uh, that will bring great sense of harmony uh, or just peace for themselves to grow well. Yeah, I have a kid of middle school and a high school student. So my question is really, uh, I didn't study here, so I always have anxiety of um, how I know what college um, they're going to go to. So not knowing the education system here, I contacted one of the organizations like Accept You, um, who will plan for the college and they give a nice um, preparatory um, advice. So when I contacted them, it's like $250 per hour. I was like, oh my God, this month, like $8,000 package or $10,000 package, which package you want? Can... So my question is really, is it really worth spending that much time or money on those kind of uh, college preparatory organizations or is there any material that I can go through and learn myself in order to prepare my kids for the college? Um, to address that question, there are so many free resources out there to really educate yourself on. 
One of my favorite is collegedata.com. That is a great tool. There's also a lady who worked for Money Magazine named Lynn O'Shaughnessy. She, uh, the College Cost Lab, she has some of the best blogs that you can really take the time to educate yourself. And then you'll have the baseline information to really make a decision. Hey, now where I am, do I understand this? And do I need to make that type of investment? A lot of times you don't really need to make the investment because the resources are there. Coming to things like this, going to things at your school, that's really where you're going to get educated. And that's probably 90% of the battle. Uh, I can add to that because we were in the same shoes as you. Uh, we have not studied here, so everything was kind of a brand new process for us. Even the naming of the freshman year, sophomore, I, it took me like a year to really understand what it meant. Uh, and it's a fact. So for us, uh, uh, my wife and myself and even my son, uh, in Atlanta, all the colleges come over here for orientation, for college camps and things like that. We would just go in there even when he was freshman in high school, sit there, try to understand what the expectation of the college is, try to talk to a few parents what they are doing. And that kind of gave us our baseline rather than talking to a, a kind of a professional organization or something because going to different places gave different perspective to us and that kind of really helped us when he was uh, actually applying for his college. And we did it for all three years, right? And not only that, once he once he attended few of the colleges, he knew where he kind of wanted to apply. So during the junior year as well as senior year, we actually went to each of these colleges, right? Even for four hours, five hours, talked to the admission officer, took a tour over there, and that gave a different perspective. And wherever possible, uh, I think one of the kids that in the panel also said that, if you get the perspective of the student from the campus, Nothing, nothing can beat that particular experience for your child. I'll say one more thing uh, just to add on to everybody said that I think we started our process, uh, I'm just like uh, Manish here that we both did not go to school here, uh, I mean at least undergrad, uh, but I think we, we have a lot of friends all over, uh, all over the country and when we visited them we went to the campuses. Uh, not to do nothing, like not to uh, kind of like say you need to go here, but we wanted our children to have a perspective what it means to be in on college campus. Uh, uh, as um, uh, I hope uh, you have this conversation with your children that they are going to go to college. <laughs> That's one thing that you can start doing in middle school, uh, which is not an option for Indian families, <laughs> if I can take the liberty to say that. But um, second thing we did is uh, we had some friends. I had a, a friend who went to um, a Harvard Physics PhD, and we had a friend who went to MIT. And so we went, uh, whenever we went to different universities, uh, I went to OU. So when we did that, we went and toured or talk to a person who went to that school and took the parents' perspective. And when they become a little bit older, we had other family friends whose children were in college. So we actually went and saw them uh, as a part of the family trips that we did. So that really helped uh, put a casual perspective on college life, um, other than application for yourself. Yeah, and and in re getting information is not at all difficult, like, uh, uh, like the panelist said that if you research and uh, you should do the research and you should also make sure your children do the research, right? Because your research is going to be kind of tilted towards your thought process and may not align with your children, but together both of the research will really help you. And I would just say to summarize, there are some people who find that it is helpful to have someone guide them along through the process, so it's not that there's not a role for that type of service, but it's not going to substitute for your own work. So you want to be involved in, in talking with your friends, going to visit the colleges, getting that that perspective for yourself before you go out. You can't just hire somebody and say, I'm going to pay you a lot of money and you're going to tell me where to send my kid to college. Because <laughs> I, I don't think you'll be happy with the outcome. So it's, it, it's not that. It might be a supplement for some families that they find helpful and there are people who work in all sorts of different price ranges for those services. Um, so I wouldn't take the first estimate you get either if you call in and that's not in your budget. So there are people who work by the hour and who can help you, or there are people who will do free consultations, or there's your college counselor at school. There are so many resources, and it doesn't have to be either or. It could be both and. I think the more information you have, the better. So. Well, uh, 
my question is related to the stress. Uh, like uh, one of you have said that uh, the professor isn't doing the right job if the student is not stressed out. So as a parent, what can we do to help our children not to stress out? Because if they stress out, it comes somewhere to us also. So what's your advice? Uh, you know, help them. Uh, whatever they have to deal with, deal with, but not get stressed out and not lose the clothes. Well, one of the things that I think is really key is to make sure that your child is whatever institution they're at, they're there for them. And I know a lot of parents have dreams and aspirations for their kids, but part of the pressure is, is they feel like they're letting their parents down, that their parents have worked with them and gotten them to this point, and now when they're struggling, and if you're going to a top college, again, if they're not struggling a little bit, that's like asking you to do your ABCs. You're great at it, but it's not a struggle. So they're going to ask you maybe to do it in Arabic backwards. You know, that's going to be a struggle. So if you can allow them to be there, make sure they're in an environment that they want to be there so the pressure is internal, not external, and also try to select a school that's a good fit. MIT, because they know they're so stressful, they're pass-fail freshman year or first semester and then second semester, uh, it's, pat, it's a grade or no grade reported, which means if you do poorly, the grade doesn't even show up. It doesn't show up as you didn't pass it. It didn't exist. Because they said, You're all, we're not here to have a tiered environment, which puts a lot of stress on the children, as you just mentioned. We're here to help educate you, and we want you to push yourself. If you're so focused on grades, you're going to add additional stress. So as parents, I would say, Make sure it's what your child wants to do. Make sure it's the right institution that's a match for them. And let them know, like the first speaker said, your success is not tied to whether you got an A, a B, or a C. We'd like to see you graduate. But outside of that, learn something and take that pressure off of them. And, and I think it goes back to the first question about time management. Stress comes because of the time management. So if you break down the tasks that you have if you are in high school, right, and you kind of focus to complete them. And again, I talked about a general milestone at the end of the year, but again, it can be converted to a weekly basis so that you know whether you are in the path because ultimately when the time comes for college application and things like that, if you have not completed some of the tasks, you are under pressure. And if you are under pressure, you're not going to do a good job of about it, right? So, so that's when this time management really, really helps you to reduce the stress. And I want to add also that part of the process happens before you get to college. And maybe the question that you're asking was more geared towards the anxiety that they're feeling, the stress that they're feeling now when they're still in your home. Um, and so going along with what our other panelists have said here, you know, part of that happens here during the high school years. And so there needs to be a balance. Um, you know, having those family dinners, allowing them to go out with their friends, having other extracurricular activities that they enjoy and that they, they choose to do, um, and managing and monitoring how they're reacting to, to each of those activities. And, you know, sometimes, you know, the pressure of them getting into these Ivy League schools, uh, in, you know, taking all these AP, AP classes, is just too much. And, you know, even though their goals may be that, you know, how do we figure out the balance of what is too much? Because if the anxiety gets to a point that, that they are no longer able to perform at their optimal capability, then, then, they're not, then they're not going to achieve those goals either way. So, so part of the process, again, starts in high school. Where, where they're communicating with you, where they're building those relationships with you to tell you, yes, you know, I'm feeling really stressed, um, and then finding ways to, to offset that balance, whether it's going and exercising, whether it's sleeping, whether it's having, you know, making sure that they're eating regularly, um, or they're spending time with the family, any kinds of activities that your child would find enjoyable. Um, and so that, I think, again, the process happens before you get um, to college. I think that if I can add last point to that, that one thing, just like uh, you said, that the experience of advocacy needs to happen in high school. Are your children going to their teachers to ask questions? Are they going to their counselors when they get stressed? Are they talking to their college counselor with questions? My, my experience from my practice, as well as with my children, uh, and which I kind of work towards that, is they want to be good at something without needing any help. 
and I don't understand how that is possible. And so I think this, uh, this myth that surrounds uh, this notion of if I'm smart, I shouldn't need help, no, you need to bust that, and you need to teach them how to bust it. So one of my um, goals for my children was every week they had to meet with one teacher to ask a question, and they thought it was ridiculous. First of all, they have no questions, and the teachers have no answers. So, so that was the problem right there. But I think what, when we flipped, when both my kids went to college, uh, one of the things uh, at Columbia, for example, they have an advisor, and they're required to meet once. I made both my children meet them twice. Um, and I said, we are paying your tuition, we need you to meet with them twice. And they said, they don't require. And I said, I don't care. <laughs> and the primary thing that came out of that is, of course, their conclusion was they were useless, which I don't believe that. <laughs> but I think there's a genuine fear of forming a relationship with somebody that you don't know. And if you know, you feel you belong. And I think you need, it's your obligation as parents to make your children feel they belong. And they, this needs to be a style. It's a lifestyle. It's, a, it's not going to happen when you are in trouble. It's going to happen when you have no problems. And I think please help them cultivate that tendency to relate to the universe within they operate. Uh, I'm launching a podcast in two weeks uh, talking to a college counselor about this very thing. Making into college is really not a problem. It's staying in college. And so make sure you focus equally on staying in college. Okay, for, for a break, um, my question is not related to college here. Somebody asked me to check here. So, uh, what would you say to the parents uh, when they come to know that their kids are uh, smoking pot or cigarettes? So how do you react to it? Anybody? 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 <laughs> Um, yes, I can tell you stories. <laughs> Not my own children's, but I, I work with those. Um, so I think you, you have to go back to this issue about stress management. Um, and I think uh, also a little bit about brain chemistry. Um, pot offers the relief that none of your counseling is going to offer. <laughs> and it also um, uh, is a culture. So the kind of roommate, uh, one of my son's, roommates was a major pothead and uh, there was uh, quite a bit of a campus activity that my son had to witness. Um, when we signed up, it's a very interesting story, I should not disclose this in public I guess, but I think you need to know <laughs> that, that uh, we found out that one of his roommates, uh, one of my son's roommates, uh, was friends with a friend of ours uh, who lives in New York. And so this girl told my son that he's a heavy pothead in high school. So we found that out and it was a little bit of a stress because my children not only are raised to really, really have God's fear about uh, drugs and alcohol, but they have had no exposure, so I think, <laughs> thought. Uh, but, uh, um, but I think they, were, they didn't have any strategy to know what to do if somebody else did it, let alone do I have this choice for myself? So I think uh, one of the things that you may want to talk about is what is your personal belief about uh, smoking pot or witnessing somebody smoke pot? I think if you have, draw the set, uh, line in the sand that no pot, I think you're setting yourself up for with a little bit of a stress that they don't know what to make of it. Um, and secondly, I would say that um, I, pot is not the only worry I have. Alcohol is also a huge worry. So I think you as a family need to talk about it. You as your children need to have some facilitators who either drink or smoke and what they think of that. Um, and so I think I would just, it's a complicated matter to be, but I'm sure uh, our psychologist friend can talk about it and your experiences also can help people understand a little bit more. Concern that that your child may may be tempted by it, or is is the concern? What what is the concern? Because you just made kind of a, a broad statement about you know alcohol and, and drug drug use. Say that again. A temptation. General. Let's talk about temptation. It was the temptation. Yeah. Was that okay? Mm -hmm. Just a general question. So, so again, I mean, whether it's, I mean, I think that that's maybe kind of what you were pointing to is, you know, the temptation, right? Um, or, or just general. So, 
again, you know, if if you are are a family who does not believe in, in any of that, whether it's alcohol or or any kind of drug use, um, again, those conversations are conversations that happen, I think, before college starts, and you know. Sometimes some parents will choose to tie that into whether parents will continue to pay for tuition, and that's a very kind of strict line that that you're drawing um, in in the, in the sand. Um, but I do think that the temptation is there, and I think that um, to to think that that the temptation and the exposure is definitely going to be there. I think it's it's even present in high schools. Um, so I think that if we're thinking that it's just going to be happening at college, um, <laughs> then I think we're kind of disillusioned a little bit. Um, but there is a lot of research um, out on the table, outside. I've um, included a couple of articles on drinking and um, that's that were written by the American Psychological Association. Uh, and, and I think it is important to, to understand if your child is starting to go down that path where they're drinking or they're smoking or they're doing other things, why are they doing it? Is it more social? Is it that they're trying to cope with their anxiety or their stress? Um, another thing that, that I think you do need to be aware of is that when um, there are students that are in these Ivy League schools, sometimes um, they're also using um, prescription medications that are not prescribed to them. So, you know, they're going to their friends and they're getting um, stimulant medications to help them do more, you know, so they're going and they're getting Concerta and Stratera and Vyvanse and they're purchasing it from their peers so they can stay up later and they can study harder and they can make better grades. Um, and that's, that's not okay either. So again, part of it is, is continuing that communication with your child when they're in college. Do you notice that there's a change in their behaviors? Um, and if so, you know, to, to what extent, being able to have those conversations. And, you know, at that point when you get to college, you know, you would want your child to think of you as an ally. That if they're at a point where, you know, they, they are not doing well in school, that they've, you know, they're missing classes, can they come to you and talk to you and say, listen, you know, I'm in trouble, or I'm super stressed and I'm not, I'm not able to manage. Um, and again, I think a little bit of stress is, is okay, you know, but it gets to the point where if you're missing classes, you're, you know, you're about to get on academic probation. Those are the times when, when stress is not okay. And just to give a, another note on that, so how do you even know that's happening if you're not there, right? They're off at college and you have no idea. So you don't necessarily get access to your kids' grades when they go away unless you, you get signed permission from the student. So make sure if they're going off to college and you're paying the bill that they sign that permission for you to have access to their, your, their grades and that you're looking at them. Because if, if you're not looking at them and you're just taking their word for it, yeah, mom, everything's great. There, there have definitely been more circumstances than I want to count of, of parents calling and saying, okay, my, my son just blanked out of his first year and we had no idea until they came home. So and that's, that's also a red flag, right? If you see a bunch of zeros in their, in their grade book, if their grade is extremely low in their class, that might just be because they don't know how to manage their time or it might be something more serious. So if you're trying to keep tabs on things, it's, it's a good thing to be aware of that you can have access to that, but you don't necessarily get access to that unless you ask. So. We, have, we have just 10 more minutes, so I will be Okay. Um, so I have a question that has to do with some of the things that you guys have talked about. Not in this previous question, we're not quite there yet with my daughter. But, you know, the one before that where you talked about balance, uh, you talked about time management. Um, so I have a daughter that's uh, in college, uh, she's getting ready for her sophomore year, um, Georgia Tech, and uh, she loves to dance. So one of the things that she did first was, you know, join one of the dance groups in, in Georgia Tech, um, and that's her passion, and you know, she had a great time. But the downside of that is they practice like three days a week for, you know, I mean, three, four hours late into the nights. Um, so, needless to say, it did affect her grades a bit, you know, and so basically what we're telling her as parents is, yes, we understand the balance, we, we realize that you've got to do things that you like to do, but at the end of it, I mean, you're going to probably affect a grade and it may be too late before you cut that down and now you've got that, you know, in your record. So we're, we're constantly trying to kind of remind her that, you know, you may have to not do this next year. So my question to you guys is that as parents, are we doing the right thing? Because we, we you know, like I know you just said uh, about checking grades. So we do check her grades. We know where she's at and she's, she's doing well. But 
she's right at the edge we think sometimes and you know it, it's it's been really difficult so we just tell her why are you taking this difficult path and and not doing what you're supposed to do um you know so i just want to ask if this is the right approach or you know what should we be doing uh, i can kind of relate uh <laughs> my my son's at, at MIT and um he's a biology major and so we go down for parents weekend and uh he's in the improv group and so we're there and he's on stage and i've never seen him string two sentences together usually it's like uh-huh yeah dad so now he's on stage his brother doesn't recognize him because that cannot be my brother they practice starting at like 11 o'clock at night four days a week to like one o'clock and it's uh so i had a problem so i i know dad what you're feeling like i'm not paying you know you don't go to juilliard to major in physics and you don't go to mit to be uh, an improv guy but we talked to the counselors and they said they are actually looking forward to that that's something that helps relieve the stress that helps them not be a robot they're there to expand themselves and if not now when are they going to do it they're in, when they're in med school are they going to do it when they get a job so if she has that passion of, of, of dance when is she going to get a chance to express that if not in college so life is more than just the grades and so i'm basically repeating what somebody told me uh <laughs> so we do have to step back and let them explore those things because that's part of being a whole person and sometimes the more they have on their plate the better they manage their time because they know their time is precious so i'd say kind of breathe a little bit let her do what's her passion and as long as the grades don't slip too far you know let her enjoy you know her time at georgia tech i can add now that you added something yeah. <laughs> so so my son is also at mit and uh, he joined the fraternity coming from india not studied here that word itself was scary for us as a family <laughs> right and we had no idea what to expect but he was very adamant that he wanted to do not only that before he joined he already had made plans that he's going to move to the frat house in sophomore year so like he didn't know how to communicate with us and give us information in pieces right so he blurted out everything which was okay but we initially were very scared but he's not with us he's in boston there and we are here so we let it go but what we realized very quickly was that joining a frat uh, means it's at mit uh, there were different ages of kids in that fraternity right and he being the freshman he got tons of guidance from the little older kids right so definitely in the dance group also there would be kids of different ages different grades who have gone through some of the challenges in different years and they were kind of willing and very very happy to guide him through that process right so every activity has some kind of challenges but also advantages associated with it because you are with a different peer group and you really get help associated with that so i uh, means frat was scary for us but now that we look back right i uh, means we ask questions that we like answers to for to him so that's another thing but uh, we, we got a lot of good information that he's getting got good help from them <laughs> this is the funniest part and thank you for asking that question because we get to tell you something light and wonderful about this process that uh, my uh, we look at our children and we say to my husband and I say to each other we have created monsters <laughs> <laughs> because we wanted them to be ambitious and hard working and stretch themselves to the limit and they do it all now and we are scary scared so i i think it's hypocritical of us we want it but then we don't want it uh, i just want to tell you the last year of my son my older son who just graduated this year uh, he was in the senate of uh, school whatever uh, the university um, senate and then he was uh, in cus comedy uh, a, a cus comedy means the the short form is it's a sketch comedy not cus it short forms to cus c u s s columbia uh, university uh, sketch comedy but um he was um he's a leader of a cappella group he was a captain of bhangra team he was a, a, on a startup where they were uh, he was programming uh, for a something called swipe which is giving unused meal plan to children uh, students who have no access to meals uh, he was doing that he was teaching in harlem um, and he had taken five courses uh, 
Um, and he was uh, writing to White House, so his um, a cappella group can be invited to perform. Um, so I'm just saying, when we saw that, we, we saw that when he prepared a resume to apply for a job, and we couldn't believe he's doing that. And still, so I do want to tell you as parents, B is okay. So I think you are so used to smart kids who finally made it to make it into good schools, and if you have been pampered with A's, allow B's. It is not a death of a character or <laughs> or their college education, you know. Uh, and I think uh, mostly the conversations we have had with our children is uh, what is not acceptable to us. So few things are not acceptable. No communication is not acceptable to us. Um, no excellence is not acceptable to us. It's okay to have a C, but no excellence is not acceptable. That means if you're struggling, you have to see your counselors. That is a mandatory thing for us. And, and uh, we also feel what's not acceptable is that you, you're not coming home. Uh, or no, you're not, uh, you know, like taking a chance to have a break. So those are the things I think you can put in place for nurturing your children, I guess. And then, we have five more minutes, so we'll just take two more questions and we'll go ahead. I, I just wanted to add quickly onto that, just from the student's perspective, because I talk with a lot of students who are currently in college, struggling to manage their time, and they're not going to study all the hours of the day anyway, I can tell you. <laughs> so even if you take her out of the dance group and say, okay, now you've got three more hours to study, chances are that she's not going to use those three hours to study. She's going to go on Facebook. She's going to hang out with friends. Because she, she needs a, she needs a time to relax, and she needs time to be herself, and she also needs exercise. So if she's getting exercise through her dance group, um, I would maybe think twice before pulling her out. Hi. As a parent um, from, from Bangladesh, and I grew up in the United States, um, we do have very high expectations for our children. And we try to communicate with them. I have, a, I have two high schoolers, one who is entering 11th grade and one who is entering 9th. And one of the panelists said they can be compliant or they can be rebellious. And I have both. <laughs> so my uh, question is, how do you communicate with your children so that they are receptive and, they, and that we don't come across as someone who is just being didactic? Um, I try very hard to uh, expose them and give them ideas and I do encourage them. But sometimes they view us as being um, um, pressurizing them. You're giving me too much pressure now or they become anxiety with it. How do we do that in a way where they see us as their partners, as their advocates, and not as enemies? That is an excellent question. And, and it's interesting because you have one of each, right? One who is very compliant and he's like, okay, mom, I'm going to do whatever you say, no problem. Another one who's probably pushing the limits all the time. Um, and I would have to say that the one who's pushing the limits all the time is the one that you probably have to focus on a little bit more. And, and I think what ends up happening a lot of times is that parents sit down and when they sit down, it's all about, you know, what are you doing and how is that great and what's going on here? And, and it's 20 questions and, if they're not, if their mind, if they're not intrinsically motivated to be doing well in that particular, or maybe their goals are not the same as yours, they they will not hear you. I mean, they'll hear you, but they won't hear you. <laughs> um, and so, part of it is, is kind of taking a step back, and again, nurturing that relationship. Um, and so, it can include just going out and and I know that this seems like it's it's not the thing to do to get to your end goal but it is where you take them out and maybe you go and do something fun with them and and just talk about nothing <laughs> you know talk about the person walking down the street um, you know just really kind of connecting with them and then as time goes on if if they're not viewing you as again the person that that is pushing them and pressuring them then slowly hopefully those lines of communication will, will open up to where you can start talking about, okay, what, what are your goals? And again, their goals may not be the same as yours. And I think that that's where, where the difficulties are. And sometimes, you know, you may have a child who's incredibly gifted, but then they may also have other, other difficulties. Maybe it's anxiety, maybe there's a little bit of attention issues, maybe there's a learning difficulty. And yes, learning difficulties do happen with kids who are gifted. And how do we kind of balance that? So are we pushing a child who, who may have difficulties who may not feel strong? Now, sometimes it could just be purely a self-esteem thing. So I feel like taking a step back and, and just having those moments. And, and it could be that if they're interested in, I don't know, comic books, video games, um, 
YouTube, which I know, you know, <laughs> um, any, any of those things. Try and engage in their world the same way that you would if you had a toddler. You know, you're not going to spend the, the time with a toddler, you know, doing very complex things. You're going to do what the toddler wants to do. So the same thing happens when you're trying to raise a teenager, especially a rebellious one. So trying to kind of connect with them at that level where there's no pressure and then eventually starting to have those, uh, those conversations about, you know, what is it that you want? What are your goals? And then maybe there's, there's, there's a common ground somewhere in there. Uh, what I can add is uh, you have to try to find when and how they are opening up to you, right? And that is what you have to keep on kind of expanding on. So for us, the most important time with him was dropping him to school and bringing him back. That 45 minutes of drive to school and coming back was when he would download and tell us everything that was happening around him, right? And then when he came home, it was like complete shutdown and you, you, you don't know what he's doing, you could, don't know what he's trying to finish, right? So, but you knew what his targets were, what was happening around him, and then we could feed him the guidance or ideas that we needed him to do because we knew what was happening around him. So, uh, for us, it was getting into a car. If you are in that closed box, he doesn't have a phone, he doesn't have an iPad open, that is when he would start talking, and that was very helpful to us. So, even a long drive would, very, would be very, very helpful to us. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, I have the question. question. I have is, uh, I went to Delhi for my master's and I heard about this thing called break here. Let me take a break. I was hoping my children never find out what they did. <laughs> so my 13 year old comes to me and says, Mom, there's something called a break here. I said, No, 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 there's no break. You're going to high school, you're going to college, you're getting married, giving me grandchildren. There's no break. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my question is, what is the point of a break here and what is the mindset? Is it certain kids who want to take it? Or our parents uh, even asked, really, what is the break here? What is the concept? Because I've never heard of it before I came here. That was kind of a new one to me too, but uh, actually I found out that more than a few people are doing it in particular. Um, at some of the schools, uh, I use MIT, and I think your son is, is a situation. Uh, my son uh, was only 17 when he started school. I think Neil, I was 17 or 16? 16. 16. So a lot of times it's not academics, it's emotionally. Are you emotionally mature to be with, you know, 18 and 19 year olds? Um, quite often you see parents talking about bragging, my child graduated from college in two and a half years. What are you rushing for? They have, they have 50 years to work. So the thing is sometimes that break year is good so they can find themselves. Uh, as we said, I think there's probably a bigger learning curve between 17 and 18 or 18 and 19 than it is going to be between 24 and 25. So wouldn't you rather them take a break and decide what they really want to do? So when they do go to college, they're more focused, they're more driven on what they want to do instead of just spending your money and kind of, you know, blindly feeling around. That was contrary to me as well. I'm like, hey, we got to get this thing done. I got to retire sometime. <laughs> but, uh, but I really think if they're really pushing that, and I know colleges now, if you're a little younger, actually like that as long as you fill that time with something meaningful, volunteering, uh, doing something in your life and not just spending it playing video games, that's actually valuable and it's not frowned upon. And probably when they're interviewing for an internship after their freshman year, they might have a heads up on some of the people that just went from senior year to freshman year in high school. I mean, freshman year in college. Um, I'll add to that. Those, those are such wonderful points. I think uh, there's something called red shirting, uh, which is holding your child back uh, when they enter kindergarten. And I think as Indians, parents, some of you or many of you may not be familiar with that. So l my son, uh, Neela, I probably, Neela and my younger son were classmates. Uh, so my younger son is right in the middle of the uh, class year. So 50% of the population was younger than him and 50% was older among 200 kids. But my, yo my older son was the youngest in his two class of 200. Um, and so I think, so when you have children, who are going to enter freshman year? Who so the uh, one of his friends entered Columbia at age he was going to become 20 when he was it was November of that year, and my son was going to turn 18. So I think there is a emotional maturity, but the biggest problem is I think social adjustment. How do you tackle 
living with people who are completely different than you? How do you handle when some, your roommate is drunk? How do you handle when people are dating? Uh, how do you handle when your professor assigns you 35 chapters? You have no problems with that, but the whole floor is not going to bed till 3 a.m. <laughs> and you're used to studying in a quiet environment. So I think those are the issues that uh, can be uh, tweaked by this gap year. And the gap year is as, as well, um, in my practice, many, many of my students, I recommend them. These are really intellectually gifted, capable, but their survival it has, is at a little bit of stake because they are not fully prepared emotionally to handle the pressures of adjusting to a novel situation. So it, it's not, and again, it, not to look down upon that as if it's a failure of parenting or a child's. In fact, it's a glorious moment. Like it's a way you can um, show it on your resume. I know a lot of, uh, there are a lot of programs that you can go to South America or India you can do service, you can work for Vibha in India, uh, and you can contribute to society and you have a perspective of being useful somewhere else before you, again you go back to that selfish, self-centered way of thinking about you in the center of the universe. Absolutely, and I, I actually just did a summer interview series where Andy talked about one of these topics was the gap year or the bridge year or the break year or whatever you want to call it. It's becoming more and more common for students, and it's not just for kids who are underdeveloped emotionally or have challenges or who can't deal with their roommates, although that's a very good reason to do it, because and the executive functioning skills develop another year, so all of that is, is improved. But it's also for kids who just aren't sure what they want to do. They're going in, they're undecided, they don't know what their major is, um, they don't have a direction, and they don't really have a reason why. So if you ask them, why are you going to college, they couldn't really tell you otherwise, other than it's the thing you're supposed to do. And so if they have no reason why, and they can take that for a year and go get involved in an activity they're really interested in, or go over uh, to another country and serve in some way, sometimes that helps them come back with more perspective on what they, are, they want their life to be about, and what they want to do, and why they want to go to college. So those kids tend to be much more successful in college. That's why a lot of colleges, even you know, Harvard, Princeton, big name colleges are now asking students, will you be taking a bridge year or not when you come? So they're actually going to bring it up, even if you don't. <laughs> Uh, I have a quick question. Of course, I've already had the mic for a while. Sorry. <laughs> he forgot me totally. So my question is, we are moving to Chicago very soon, and my son is in, in the 12th grade, so just one year left. That's it. So um, I want to understand, is there any kind of uh, scholarships that you could recommend or uh, in-state uh, tuition fees? Because that's a big um, concern for us as parents, because we'll just have one year uh, before my son goes to college. So if you could uh, throw some light to that. Uh, so a lot of times it can be tricky because you have to establish residency for a specific period of time. So I would definitely, the first thing I would do probably when you, Monday, is call the schools and ask them, what is the residency requirement to get in-state tuition? That's going to be the biggest driver of that. Um, there are a lot of different things that you can do to maximize uh, merit aid, financial aid at a lot of the schools. Um, but again, you've got to figure out how long it's going to take to establish in-state residency so you can be eligible for in-state tuition. Actually, there was an interesting article today about that. There's no right or wrong answer to that. A lot of times, you know, people say six to ten is ideal. And really the reason is because most people do not know what the incoming applicant pool looks like. So you really want to hedge your bet. And again, especially if you're going to elite schools, you have to apply to a lot of those. And especially we can get into early decision, early action, and things like that. So it really depends, but I would say at a minimum six, um, 10 to 12, 33% of all kids do apply to seven or more now. And it, it's actually making admissions a lot harder. And uh, we'll go over some of that in the presentation. We're going to have a full session of scholarships and financial aid uh, today. I, Rex, if I could say one thing real quick. If you can, if I can say one, end with one thing that could help you out more than anything else, sit down with your child, uh, get in the senior year, hopefully end of junior year, take them by, let them see those colleges, let them talk to somebody in those colleges, but make sure they have a college that they want to go to the most. Because I, I interviewed for Duke University, and literally half the class was filled with early admission. 
Then you had the rest fighting. And it was an ugly scene. 7% of people who applied regular admission got in. And they were all brilliant. And it's not, and there are people that are already got in that were not as qualified, but they went early admission because the schools are rated um, on basically the acceptance rate and people that reject their schools. So if they can fill half their class with people that that's their number one choice, because as the gentleman just said, there are people who apply to 10 schools and they have no intention of going to that school. So then when they give them an offer and they don't accept it, it's called yield. They look bad that, you know, they're giving these offers and kids don't want to come. So they said, I want to first look at the kids that are guaranteed that want to be here first. So if you're worried about, instead of doing a lot of applications, and also can take stress off your child. If they get into their first choice right away, those other ones, they can breathe very easily. So if nothing else, if you want to increase your chances substantially at top schools, apply early admission. Can I make one note on that? One thing I do see when you go ED, you really have to understand your financial position. Yes. Because if you go ED, that is a binding deal. And if you don't realize that you're potentially a full pay candidate, to have a binding deal now that's $75,000, that might not be affordable for your family. So again, kind of knowing before you go and especially applying ED and early action is critical. Thank you very much. What do you think of this parent panel? <laughs> so we introduced this session and the student interactive session based on the feedback that we got from the last year. So we are going to send an email to you in a couple of days or two days. Uh, we really request you to give us the feedback and uh, based on that, we will try to improve the program. And I just got in a, a video on that uh, student interaction session is in full swing or just finished and they were having a blast. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now I'd like to... Okay, we'd like to invite, uh, we have a CEO of Viva today here in our audience, Mr. Kanan Udayrajan, the Indian Energy CEO. Thank you, Kevin. You can stay. And I would like to invite our Action Center coordinator, Rugesh Das. Thank you, Mr. Stewart and Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Derek Poole. And Dr. Manish And uh, And the man behind this event, to Mr. Shankar Narayana Rekhavi. We are too surprised he doesn't know that, but we are here to talk It's a small token, it's nothing compared to what you did and what you are doing, but you know, it's uh, something special. Thank you. We are going to have thank you panel experts. And uh, I would say, like I said, that we are going to have a platform where we can interact with our experts, and uh, that's going to be uh, we are planning that, and uh, we'll let you know on this. So we are going to have another interesting session for 30 minutes, and we are done for this today. Dr. 